So they provided champagne, which I'm delighted, because uh, a toast to all of you. You guys have built something um, for the ages. I'm quite intimidated to be standing here talking to you at all, and to the people in New York who we can't see or wherever, because um, I have no business telling you anything. But I can give you a warning. This is a key moment in the life cycle of the company, right? That as the stakes keep getting higher and higher, and the opportunities keep getting bigger and bigger, and the number of smart people keeps increasing, so does the competition, so do the stakes, so does um, the opportunity to, to, to pay a $200 fine. And what I want to do today is really place a stake in the ground about a key conceptual uh, underpinning that I want to sell you on, and then try to outline why I think Google has succeeded to date and how repeating that could really help you moving forward. I spent the weekend in Las Vegas, and I want to tell you, I, I spent a half an hour on a line with nothing to do but watching this 52-year-old woman play an obscure form of poker, and she was winning. And what I noticed as I watched her was that her right leg was over her left leg. And every once in a while, her left leg would go over her right leg, but then she'd get really nervous and put her right leg back over her left leg. And she kept trying to get better and better at keeping her right leg over her left leg, because you could tell that she had decided that right leg over left leg was lucky, left leg over right leg didn't work. And that what superstition is, is ascribing incorrect behavior to certain outcomes. And she had totally bought into the fact that placement of her right leg was essential. This is a picture of Gordon Bell. He's wearing a baseball cap mounted camera. He works at Microsoft now, but some of you, if the engineers in the room may know, that he's one of the people who invented the mini computer. And he sent me an email the other day because he's working on something interesting. And the name rang a bell, and I looked him up. And if you look at what digital was doing when digital was doing it, Nobody had better technology than they did. And the question is, how many of you have a digital computer on your desks? Not very many. That there is a belief among a lot of companies, especially in the Valley, especially on this road, Amphitheater Road, that technology wins. And what I want to sell you really hard on is not that technology wins, because I don't think it does. I think what technology does is it gives you a shot at marketing. <laughs> and if you don't buy into that, then I believe the company, sooner rather than later, is going to smash into a wall. This is Powerade in a fountain, and right next to it is Minute Maid. And if you look closely on the Minute Maid dispenser, you see it says contains 0% juice. <laughs> now the thing is, Minute Maid's got no juice. You guys have juice. Lots and lots of juice. The challenge isn't, do you have enough juice? Because you do. The challenge is, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to market it? Because if you market the juice properly, you won't end up like digital or the long, long list of companies that include Sun Microsystems that said, technology is going to solve every problem. The marketing will take care of itself. I believe that the underpinnings and what made Google work were some brilliant, maybe not intentional, but brilliant marketing decisions. And those decisions have allowed you the freedom to do some really cool technology. And the question I want to ask you is, how are you going to put it together? April 1999, this was Yahoo's homepage. A quick count would show you about 175 links. That same day, this was Google's homepage. Studies have been shown, done to show that if you show the average person the results of a Yahoo search in those days and a Google search in those days formatted identically, they couldn't tell which one came from who. But it was obvious when you looked at the page where you were. What happened was geeks and nerds and early adopters and people like me, the ones who are already getting, always getting bugged by their friends on how to use the internet, like what's that E thing with the planet circling around it mean? We sent our friends to Google because we knew they weren't going to come back and bother us later. Because <laughs> if you send someone to Google, they knew what to do. If you sent them a, sorry, to Yahoo, they had no clue. So we stopped sending our friends to Yahoo, and we started sending them to Google. That was a really brilliant thing that you did and continue to do. When I was at Yahoo, they built 
an amazing auction engine. An auction engine that was better by every measure, features, reliability, speed, user interface, than eBay. When was the last time you bought or sold something on Yahoo Auctions? Never. Because eBay had something going for it that Yahoo couldn't get. And it had absolutely nothing to do with technology. I'm talking about billion dollar decisions here that have nothing to do with really well executed Ajax. So the two giant marketing wins that I want to outline, you know what they are, but I want to describe them because they're at the heart of what I've been writing about for seven or eight years is this. The first one is, look at the chart. It's only two years. That growth is spectacular. That is organic growth, no Super Bowl commercials, no TV commercials, no billboards outside of the valley. Where did it come from? It came from the fact that people told their friends. That is what made you grow. Not the technology, but the fact that people chose, probably because of the technology in part, to tell their friends. Number two, this is a slide I use in almost every single presentation I do, where I really have to whap people upside the head because they believe in their brand too much. And the caption on the slide is, no one cares about you. No one wakes up in the morning wondering about you. No one cares about your stock options, your growth, or anything else. But I had to amend it for this company. First time ever, he cares about Google. <laughs> I have a Google shirt that one of your engineers sent me, and I wore it to the Union Square Market in New York City last year. And I'm walking through the market, and the woman selling peaches turns to me and she says, do you work at Google? Google is my friend. Google is my life. And it's still true even in the Jaded Valley. If you tell people you work at Google, you're guaranteed to have an intelligent conversation with them. They want to ask you all these questions. They want to touch the hem of your coat. People care about Google. That what happened is you made an audacious promise to people. You changed the way they interacted all day long when they're supposed to be working, all day long when they're surfing. You've changed their act, and that interaction made them care about your brand. And that means you have a platform to do some spectacular things. But if you blow it just a few times in a row, they won't care about Google anymore. And you'll be back to that slide, wherever it is, that slide. I'm hoping that we can stay on that one. So what's number two? Number one was organic growth, word of mouth, people caring about a brand, a brand that's like the Wizard of Oz, a brand that means an enormous amount. Number two, espresso machines. Do a search on espresso machines, 845,000 matches. But there, on the side, in blue, the engine of revenue. Why did it work? It worked for two really important reasons. Reason number one is it delivers anticipated, personal, and relevant messages to the people who want to get them when they want to get them. I do not want to see an ad word for espresso machines when I'm in the middle of driving down the highway. I don't want to see it when I'm watching the Super Bowl. But if I just type in espresso machine, I want to see an ad word for it. It's about me. It's about what I'm interested in right now. And it's delivered in a format that I want to get it. And as you try to exploit other ways to deliver revenue, what's at the heart of that is, are you delivering it in the right place at the right time in a way that people want to get? And it's what I call permission marketing, the privilege of marketing to people who want to be marketed to, of selling to people who want to be sold to. So when I look at some of the other initiatives that you're, you're going down the road with, they may be leveraging some of the people who are used to paying you money, but they're not about delivering that sort of message in that sort of way to someone who wants to get it. And that is at the core of what's driven the revenue of this company. The second reason that those ads work is that they used to cost a nickel. And the difference between the way Google put the wedge out there to get people who didn't advertise on the internet to advertise on the internet. And everybody else, is everybody else hired a lot of really expensive salespeople and tried to get Procter & Gamble to give them a million dollars. I was in that category. I, I got Procter & Gamble to give my company almost a million dollars for advertising. It takes years. And they end up forcing you to make average stuff for average people that doesn't work very well. And then you got to go out and make more sales calls. But you guys said, it's a nickel. 
and someone, some fringe person took you up on it, and it worked. And someone else came along and said, I'll pay a dime for that. And then someone else, and so now an espresso machine ad costs $5.82, no sales force required. Put those two pieces together, and you have this magnificent engine. And the challenge is, how can you take care of the buyer and the prospect in a way that makes them both happy? So the new book, the one you have a free copy of, free lunch, free scooters, free books, unbelievable, <laughs> is about cats. I hate cats. They just give me the creeps. Big ones, little ones, all cats. My son, Mo, whose birthday was yesterday. That's why, that's why we had cake to go with the champagne. <laughs> My son Mo made a contract with the people across the street that he was going to take care of their cat. And after a little while, it was a bit of a pain in the neck, and suddenly the cat was in danger, it was going to starve to death. I had to take care of the cat. <laughs> Don't like cats. Turns out, the cat only eats fancy feast cat food. <laughs> fancy feast cat food, three times the price, half the size, super stinky. First thing to understand about cat food, cat food is not for cats. If cat food was for cats, it would come in mouse flavor. <laughs> cat food, baby food is not for babies either, but that's a whole other story. Cat food, you know, this flavor, my favorite one is this one, it's grilled salmon. Because of course, cats in the wild, just they hold out. To the, you call your cat in from outside where it's torturing a small rodent, and you give it this stuff that costs $5 a can. Why? It's not for the cat, it's for you. Look what it says on the back of Fancy Feast cat food and on the website. Fancy Feast gourmet cat food is finely ground and smooth like pate, offering a taste and texture to please every cat's discriminating palate. <laughs> now the cats in California are really nervous about that new foie gras law, so you're just gonna have to leave the state if you've got one. But my point is that what the marketers at Fancy Feast figured out how to do is tell a story. When you buy Fancy Feast, you are not buying sustenance for your cat. You're buying well-being for yourself. How do I explain the fact that every day, 30 million pet plastic bottles end up in landfills in the United States when 30 years ago there was zero market for what we call bottled water. The water in the United States is the best in the world, and the stuff that comes out of the tap is free. People don't buy bottled water because they need it. We don't. We buy it because we want it, and what we want is the story we tell ourselves. We tell ourselves a story about well-being and freshness and portability and crispness and all that other stuff. And so we're paying six, seven, eight dollars a gallon for it. Chanel number no. five, no one needs that, but it costs twenty-five thousand dollars a gallon. And when we buy it, we're buying the story, the way it makes us feel. Well, here's the thing. Back to that peach seller in Union Square. Google makes people feel a certain way when they do it. If all we had was the code on your servers, we might be able to sell it on eBay for a couple hundred thousand dollars. But the story, the story that the stock market tells itself, the story that users tell themselves, the story, the belief that we've got when we use it is priceless. And the challenge that you've got, since every person in this company is a marketer, some of them are marketers who code, is to deliver on that story. How many of you remember these when you were kids? You're all geeks, you all remember this, right? How many of you, how many of you wanted a pair of x-ray specs? I'm gonna ruin the secret, just in case you were curious. The secret of x-ray specs is, the, the, the ad promises that when you hold your hand up and you put on the glasses, you can see the skeleton in your hand. Turns out, you can. Of course, if you hold up a book, you can also see the skeleton in your hand, or a cat, you can see the skeleton in your hand, because on the glasses is etched a little skeleton of your hands. Now, these cost a buck, and if you're 11 years old, a buck is a lot of money. So you mail out the buck, and you already have your money's worth, because for two weeks, you're dreaming about the power you're gonna have when you have the glasses. For two weeks, you're imagining the havoc you're gonna be able to wreak at school. Then you get them, you're heartbroken for like 10 seconds, and then you say, who can I fool? And you get two more weeks of joy for a dollar. <laughs> That's what we're doing here. That's what we do with almost everything we make, unless it's about feeding people or sheltering them. We're giving people stuff they want, a story they can tell themselves. What marketers do for a living, traditionally, is they have a funnel. 
They dump stuff in the top of the funnel, people. Most of them fall out, but every once in a while, someone comes out to the bottom and it's pay dirt. And the reason AdWords works so well is that you've got a really efficient funnel. You're able to sell people who are already halfway down the funnel, two-thirds of the way down the funnel. Right? If I want people who type in experimental kidney cancer treatment, that person isn't way up at the top. They're down here, and they're worth more. And the thing about funnel marketing is it's getting more and more expensive to put people in on the top. And what my new writing is about is about taking that funnel and flipping it onto its side and turning it into a megaphone. That what helped Google grow is not that you paid a lot of money to put a lot of people in the top, which is what started Amazon. But instead, what happened is that you flipped the funnel, and you figured out a way to get people like me to tell 100 people or 1,000 people what you had. And when I see a new Google thing coming down the road, I can look at it, and I can tell, so far I haven't been wrong once, whether it's going to spread or not, whether it's going to succeed or not. And it's all about, does the funnel get flipped? The Gmail marketing was brilliant. Right? The limited number of people going in, people being able to trade entry things, selling them on eBay for lots of money. What was it? That wasn't Google talking about Gmail. It was other people talking about Gmail. So this is a picture I show a lot. This is um, a product right there, a pain reliever. Brand manager spent $100 million last year trying to interrupt me. $100 million on coupons and shelving allowances and TV ads and magazine ads and spiffs. So that when I went to the deli, I would buy her product because it's 4% better. And if I could just buy her product, she figures I'm with it for life. And the problem is I don't have a pain reliever problem. I solved my pain reliever problem 20 years ago. I buy the stuff in the yellow box. So why should I switch? She's invisible. She doesn't exist. And what I say to most organizations is whatever you're marketing, whatever you're selling, you're the blue box. You're busy talking to people about a product that they're not interested in. I, again, I apologize. It's fuzzy. I had a bad cold when I took it. But the point of the slide is you have to decide when a new product comes along, when a new opportunity comes along, is it a blue box? I don't have an auction problem. And solving my auction problem is going to make it really hard for me to pay attention. I'm not going to pay attention to you because it's not on my list of things I'm really worried about. Craigslist didn't come along and say, we're going to solve your eBay auction problem. They solved a totally different problem that people were happy to hear about. So as you go down the list, the question as you offer these things is, are we offering a blue box? So where do you go from here? Well, it starts in France. My wife, who some of you have met, has transportation narcolepsy. She falls asleep in any moving vehicle unless there's a really good movie on the plane. And the four of us planned a long trip to France. And um, we missed a flight. We missed a connection. 17 hours, 16 and a half hours. My kids have been making a ruckus. And my wife has been asleep. And we're almost there. We're driving through this pasture. The sun is shining. The sky is blue. And I notice it's quiet in the back seat. My kids aren't making any noise at all. I look in the rearview mirror, figuring they're still asleep. Or they are asleep. They're not asleep. They're looking out the window, transfixed, staring at this perfect specimen of a cow for about five seconds. And then they went back to making a ruckus, because cows are boring. If you've seen one cow, you've seen five cows. Five cows, you've seen 100 cows. All cows are the same. But what if it had been a purple cow? What if out the window there had been a real honest to goodness purple cow? I would have pulled over. My wife would have woken up. She would have taken some digital pictures. I would have called people at home, told them I was looking at a purple cow. My kids would have jumped out of the car, run across the street, hopped over the fence, and rubbed the cow to make sure it was really and truly purple so they could tell their friends that they had touched a purple cow. Because a purple cow is remarkable. And what I wrote about in that book, Purple Cow, is what remarkable means. And it doesn't mean beautiful or ideal or perfect. It only means one thing, worth making a remark about. And the challenge is, if you're going to bother doing something, is it worth talking about? And the amazing thing about the thousands of you here is you keep doing it. You keep making stuff worth talking about. I'll show you a couple examples. Hummer and the Mini. The Mini, small enough to put in the trunk of the Hummer. <laughs> but they had a lot in common. For four years, they sold it full retail. For four years, they made a profit. For four years, they had a waiting list because they were on the edges. General Motors loses money on every mid-sized car they sell. Because if you want to buy a mid-sized car, just buy a Toyota or a Honda, the cheapest one. 
It's at the edges that people wait in line. It's at the edges that people will notice you. And as this company gets bigger, there's going to be more and more pressure to be safe, to be in the middle. So you just show them this one slide. This is how much money to scale BMW spends marketing each car sold in the United States. And that's how much money Lincoln Mercury spends. Because Lincoln Mercury makes average cars for average people and spends the money hyping them. And BMW has a marketing department called engineering. And they keep making stuff that people choose to talk about. This is the Hummer SUT concept car. The cool thing about this is the tires are designed by Nike. Big orange stripe on them. Now you could say, Nike tires are not going to get me from here to San Francisco any better. And I would say, neither is a Hummer. That no one buys a Hummer to get to San Francisco. They buy it to tell a story, to talk to their friends, to tell themselves the story, to have a message. It's the free prize, the bonus, the extra, the thing we're really paying for. Tiffany's gives the jewelry away for free. The box is what they charge for. Because <laughs> if you give somebody jewelry from Tiffany's, all they talk about is the box. That's what you're paying for, that you care enough to pay five times more than you should have. And that model, that story, there's nothing wrong with it. Tiffany's doesn't pretend. They say, if you pay this much, you get the blue box. And that's why you can do this experiment. You'll see, put a Google logo on somebody else's service and test them and see if they like it or not. And they're much more likely to like it because they tell themselves a story when they see it's from you, at least for now, if you keep it up. So it, we entered this end era of emotional marketing. If you want me to talk about something, you better deep down love it or else why should I? And it's going to become very easy as the pressure goes on to put out something that's good enough. And if it's just good enough, I'm going to notice. And I won't tell anybody. So you're in the fashion business, just like Giorgio Armani, just like Tommy Hilfiger. You change things a little, just enough, to make them worth talking about. Does the average consumer really need 2.7 gigs of storage on their email account? Probably not. But it adds to the story. It's the fashion. It was something worth talking about. So, a couple examples from the non-online world. If you decided to enter the sock business, you could say, what do socks do? And the answer would be, they give it an order, and they keep you from having blisters. And you can go to China, and you get these socks made for 12 cents. You could sell them to Walmart for 20 cents. That would be the end of that. Or you could do what this little company in Westchester called Little Mismatch did. They make. 133 styles of socks aimed at 11-year-old girls, and you can't buy a pair. They only sell them in odd numbers. The 11-year-old girl goes to school and says to the other 11-year-old girl, want to see my socks? <laughs> want to see my socks? What a great marketing strategy, because that 11-year-old girl goes to the next 11-year-old girl, and she says, I got to get some of these things. And the next thing you know, everybody in school is wearing socks that don't match. We didn't need more socks, but we wanted them. We wanted the story that goes with it. This, on the other hand, is a picture, a bad one, of chocolate-covered pickles. <laughs> so I want to just spend one minute talking about what I've been working on for the last six months, and then um, wrap things up and make sure I have plenty of time for questions. I don't think people surf the web. I think that this whole idea of surfing the web is a little bit of a fraud. Because when you surf, you're effortlessly, if you were good at it, effortlessly going from side to side, thing to thing. That's not what really people do. What they do is they poke. They poke around a lot, poking in, poking out. So if you went to that espresso machine thing, what you'd probably do is click on one, realize it was SEO, back off. Click on one of the ads, oh yeah, click back. Click on another ad, click back. Which is good for you, because that's 20 bucks of revenue if they do it four times. But back and forth and back and forth, and then finally, what you've done is you've established all these clues. You've gotten all these little things that you needed. And the problem with clues is they're too slow. The problem is that, yeah, you could find 1.9 million matches on almost any one or two word search, which is what almost everyone does. And you could poke, and you could poke, and you could poke, and you could poke. And then you're either going to give up, or finally, you're going to have meaning. If you sat down in the cockpit of the Concorde and someone said, held a gun to your head and said, launch this plane in the next 10 minutes, 
it wouldn't be easy. There's no way you're just going to flip the first switch you come to. You're going to take a few minutes. You're going to look around. You're going to try to make sure you understand the big picture before you fire up the engines. That this search for meaning is the opposite of what most people experience when they're online. They're really trapped. They're stuck. You can't get someone to be a happy surfer until there's a sense of meaning, until they get this big picture. And I think the next frontier is, and the, the project I'm working on is called Squidoo, if you want to check it out. But the idea is, how do you put in one place enough clues that in one second I get the big picture? I have enough meaning to actually go and take action. So I'm going to close by showing you two charts and telling you one story. This is what brought us Revlon and Procter & Gamble and even Cisco. Step number one, buy ads. Hire a sales force to interrupt people. Buy Super Bowl ads, TV ads, magazine ads, newspaper ads, radio ads, spiffs, all those things. Interrupt lots of people. If you have money, you can interrupt people. Once you do that, you're going to get more distribution. This is what happened to Revlon in 1946. That distribution is going to help you sell more stuff. And then, if it was 20 years ago and you were really smart, you'd take all the money you made and interrupt more people. And around and around and around it goes. And any of you who have been on a sales call or taken an incoming from someone in the outside world understands that this is still the way most people think. Anyone asks about CPM, this is what they're thinking. Anyone whose website is the same for all the keywords they buy, this is what they're thinking. This mindset is why Web 1.0 didn't work. Because everybody was busy doing this until the price of banners went down to a penny. The alternative is what I call the fashion permission complex. Step number one, make something worth talking about. If you can't do that, start over. Step number two, tell it to people who want to hear from you. And step number three, they do what other people used to think of as marketing. They're the ones who spread the word. They're the ones who interrupt their friends. And then the hardest part, and this is where Google Toolbar comes in, is get permission from these people to tell them about your next fashion. So as your asset base grows, think about the iPod, think about 60,000 people tuning in to a webcast of Steve Jobs' keynote speak, speech. As this asset grows, think about 60 million Amazon customers who get email and read it. You have the ability to launch new fashions. And you don't have to start from scratch every time. And you end up not trying to find customers for your products, but finding products for your customers. So where all this leads is to the Hallmark card and gift stores. There's 1,000 Hallmark card and gift stores all around the country. This story is true. If it wasn't true, I would make it up, but it's true. 1,000 card and gift stores around the country. Hallmark has a group of people they call their heavy users. The average Hallmark heavy user buys 52 greeting cards a year, not counting Christmas. And the problem is in July, unless you're stocking up for your Labor Day wrapping paper or your Rosh Hashanah gifts, there's just not a lot of reason to go to a Hallmark store. So they were pretty slow in July. This guy named Don comes up with an idea. Collectible Christmas ornaments. 10 bucks, limited edition, only in July. So if you're a heavy user, you stumbled into the store in July, you've given a level of permission to the clerk. She says to you, have you seen the new collectible Christmas ornaments? And now a conversation takes place built around the brand, built around interaction, that leads to that person seeing the Christmas ornaments. And in that moment, she gets $10 worth of joy before she even bought them. $10 thinking about how her family's going to feel, thinking about being in on the ground floor, thinking about selling her whole collection just before she dies, thinking about the, the whole family feeling the beautiful tree. She buys the Christmas ornament. And on the way out, the clerk says, can I have your name and address so I can send you an anticipated, personal, and relevant postcard next year when the new Christmas ornaments are ready? Sure. And then she takes the Christmas ornament home and puts it in the attic because it's July. And it stays in the attic until December. Then they put up a tree. And they take the Christmas ornaments down, and they decorate it, and people come over. Blanche, what a lovely tree. Betty, do you like it? They're my new collectible Christmas ornaments from Hallmark. Whole conversation takes place that Hallmark didn't pay for. Right? If this sounds like Google, it's because it should. Hallmark did pay for it by making something worth talking about in the first place. But now here's the missing link. 
At the end of the conversation, Blanche says to Betty, next year, or Betty says to Blanche, next year, when I get the postcard, we'll go together. And year after year after year, with no advertising at all, they built this business of people who wanted to get the postcard. And in 1999, the Wall Street Journal wrote a detailed article about it. And it turns out that on July 17th, Don sent the postcard to the people who wanted to get it. And in one 24-hour period, he sold $100 million worth of junky Christmas ornaments and made $92 million in profit, which is about how much you guys made on July 17th, but still. <laughs> and here are the two questions. Question number one, is it time for Don to ask for a raise? The answer is they made him the chairman of the board of Hallmark two years ago. And question number two is, when are you going to build an asset like that one? Right now, you have no idea who I am. You have no idea what I search for. You have no permission to talk to me directly. And I want you to do all those things. But you can't do it unless you ask first. And the opportunity, the opportunity with the toolbar, the opportunity with the interactions, the opportunity with Gmail, with all the other things you're building, is to start now, before it's too late, to build in a permission asset to build in the ability to have people want you to be a closer partner, to be there so that you can make them the next fashion and they'll listen in one day. And then you can get to the next thing. Building that asset has eluded almost everybody who's ever been on the net. The notable exceptions are Amazon and eBay. And what the opportunity here is to keep building remarkable stuff, but to build it with the compass that says if we build stuff that people want to hear about in a way they want to hear about it, they'll want to keep interacting with us. So I'm going to stop there. i got about 10 or 15 minutes for questions. And I know Katina is going to hit you upside the head if you don't answer. Ask them. I'll answer them. Or you can answer them. Oh, I hate that. Okay. All right. We can go. Yeah, because everyone will leave, and then I'll be feel really bad. OK? So you can't leave until you ask questions. Who's got any? I'll call on people. I've done it before. Yes, please. You talked about the blue box. The Google Mini, the product I represent, is a blue box. What advice do you have for me? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the Google. The Google Mini is the search appliance for small and medium businesses, so it's Google.com technology. Right. So the question is, um, I'm sorry, what's your name? Patsy markets the Google Mini, which my wife has a Mini, and I'm visualizing this orange convertible. It searches. Right. So the Google Mini is a search appliance for small and medium-sized businesses. She thinks she's got a blue box. I think she doesn't. And I think you don't because you're falling into a fairly common trap, which is it's really important to you. And you know how great it is. And you know that if everyone understood how great it is, they'd all line up to buy it. The problem is, A, most people don't have a search appliance problem. They don't wake up in the morning and say, how am I going to solve this search appliance problem? And because they don't have it, you are stuck. So you're, when you said blue box, I would thought you meant the Tiffany box. You're in the other blue box. It is a blue box. We agree. Yes, you're, in the, you're the, that blue box. So the challenge you've got is that small businesses rarely tell each other about these sort of successes. So if I bought one and it worked, I would not tell my friend who also owns a small business, you got to get this thing. So it's a problem. It's not entering a marketplace that's geared to have these conversations. So as an organization, you need to help them have the conversations. That by bringing these people together, the ones who have it and the ones who don't, by figuring out platforms where it's easy for people to talk to each other, they're more likely to talk about it. You can't say, everyone in the room, let's talk about the Google Mini. But what you can do is share a couple case studies and get out of the way and let them tell each other the truth. And that as you build these communities of people who talk to each other, things happen. So if I'm a yellow page ad salesman, the very best thing that could happen to me is I get to talk to the Chamber of Commerce. Because a third of the people there have had success with the yellow pages. Then I leave. And those third of the people stand up and start talking to the other two thirds of the people. And this idea of sneezers, the powerful ones. I'd go find people um, who have really successful blogs who are small business people, like the guy who runs um, Fogbugs. And I'd give him one. And I'd say, no strings attached, here it is. And if he starts liking it and he writes about it, now he, you're flipping the funnel. You're giving him a megaphone where he can talk to other people about how it has helped him. And so that's why blogs are really a powerful tool in making this work. So again, it's thinking about not that you deserve the, the, the conversation, in regards of how good it is, 
but how can you cause conversations to take place? Does that make any sense? Yes, sir. Yes. I'm wondering how to manage that. So um, that's a great question. We have to distinguish between brand conversation and um, product conversation. The brand conversation of Google has a lot of ennui starting to happen because we've heard it before. We don't want to hear how much the stock is worth, and we don't want to see those two pictures, the guys anymore, even when there are three of them. We just don't want to see that anymore. <laughs> you know? And that happens to every single brand there's ever been. It's going to happen here. That's different than the product conversation. So, you know, Ferraris have been around a really long time. But when the new Ferrari comes out, we want to see it on the cover of Road and Track. So that's not a conversation about Ferrari. That's a conversation about the Modena. And the challenge you guys have is, yes, Gmail 1.93 is a little better than 1.9, but we're not going to talk about that. What we are going to talk about is how cool Google Earth is, for a little while anyway, until we realize it's for most people, I can't spend my whole life on it the way I can Gmail. And the, the, so the challenge you've got is how do you keep creating new fashions, Giorgio Armani style, four times a year on a schedule that works for people, that keeps expanding the conversation. And at the core of it, and I've been talking to my friends at Mozilla about this, is the best ones are ones that work better when your friends use them too. So the reason eBay grew it's because eBay sellers told lots of prospective buyers, go check out my auction. So there are certain things you guys are launching that work better, like video, if lots and lots of people use them. They're, so it's easy to talk about those, because there's selfish motivation. But there are other things you're launching that don't. And those aren't going to get talked about nearly as much. And so you need a blend. You need to have utility in there, like the Google Mini. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you want to grow, the real growth is going to come from things that work better when my friends get them too, and I will selfishly tell my friends to go do it. Yes, please. Yeah? They find you. OK? So the question is, where do you find the first group of people to tell your story to? The answer is, they find you. That there is a group, if your product is really going to be remarkable to them, they're out searching. They've got that otaku. They're always looking for the next ramen noodle shop that's better than any other ramen noodle shop there ever was. And so the people who are in the fashion business don't have to run lots of TV ads, which is worth more than Vogue without the ads, because they're paying attention. So the beauty of it is you already have the attention of millions and millions and millions of people. The challenge is not to bludgeon all of them when you have something that appeals to a small number. That instead, it's about slicing the, the group into their real um, desires and obsessions and talking to the smallest possible group, overwhelming that group with the goodness of it. So my favorite example is Napster. Napster could have launched in nursing homes. The problem is that nursing homes don't have high-speed net access, and they're not that interested in new music. But the real problem is that people in nursing homes don't know many other people. Whereas people on college campuses know 50 other people. So you could get a, persuade one person in one nursing home that she'd only tell three people. Persuade one person at the University of Michigan, he tells 50. And they tell 50, now you're 2,500. So it's going to grow much faster. So Napster only needed to persuade 50 people before it got to 5 million, all by itself. And that's the best kind of idea viruses. The ones where you just need a tiny group of people who are already interested. You don't have to twist their arm. Yes, sir. So one thing that's really popular right now and uh, for certain kinds of products like video games and um, electronic gadgets is you know to hire people to go into forums and do like buzz marketing for you, right? And kind of infiltrate the secret society and kind of tell people how great your product is. How does that play into the permission model? And, and is that like a genuine way? Because there's a certain element of like not genuineness to it. When people find out, they feel kind of cheated. Well, I think there's a certain element of scum, fraud, deception, lying, <laughs> deceit. And I think you always get caught. And Sony got totally hammered with the uh, graffiti campaign they did. And there's not a lot of patience in communities for being used. So 
there are always people who are willing to come and you know, pour pesticide into the pond, and the rest of us have to suffer. But the people who are in it for the long haul don't succeed by doing that. You can't. Because the beauty of the net is it's 360. And people can look behind and at the side. And it, it, what I say in All Marketers Are Liars is the worst thing you can do is be a fraud. That the reason Ford Motor Company laid off 25,000 people is that for seven years they defrauded people about SUVs. For seven years they told us that SUVs were reliable and efficient and safe. When in fact, they lead to wars and people dying in traffic accidents. And if they had told us a true story, they'd still be around. But instead, people all of a sudden one day realized what was going on. And you look at Ford Explorer sales, they went like this at the same time that car stuff went like this. Because people find out the truth. And once they find out the truth, they never forgive you. And if you don't believe me, ask someone who works for a tobacco company. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes, sir. So do you think we're, we would be better off launching a thousand remarkable ideas, but each worked so-so, uh, because we don't have the resources to work them thoroughly, or focusing on 10 remarkable ideas and executing them perfectly, giving them all the attention they deserve, but then we can only do 10 instead of 1,000? Well, see, I think the mythical man month comes up here. You know, Nine women working in perfect harmony can't have a baby in a month. And so I'm not sure that it's a fair trade of 10 perfect ones versus 1,000 half-assed ones. I think instead what works is saying strategically, where are the places where we're most likely to be able to have the right combination of sneezers and permission and people who are obsessed with a product that wants to spread versus how do we do all the things that pop into people's heads that can be done? And so you know, when we look at fashions that succeed, the Numa Numa song all the way up to um, you know, a car design that was done by one guy in one night, it doesn't usually have a lot to do with the last 500 people who perfected it. It usually has a lot to do instead with it being in the right place at the right time with the right story. And so I don't think it has anything to do with how many you launch. I think you just have to take a deep breath and spend an hour to say, what's our story? And should we cancel this right now before it's too late? Because there's a lot of things that come out, because you can do them, not necessarily from here, but in the world, because you can do them. When if instead you said, there's no story here, we're only doing it because we can, you're much better off not. That's sort of where I'm coming out. Thank you, Alex. Yes, sir. I was wondering if you had an opinion on what we've done wrong with Google Maps. It was really amazing when it came out like, two years ago or something. And it's like spread among all nerddom. But like my sister visited me over the weekend and they had MapQuest maps and I just you know, dagger through my heart. <laughs> and and now, you know, Yahoo has scrollable maps, Microsoft has scrollable maps, and and you know, we've got this cool thing, but but I, it seems like nobody really knows about it. Okay. So I do have an opinion. I have an opinion on everything. And I don't know what I'm talking about. Those are just two caveats. <laughs> Problem number one is when you launch Google Maps. For most people who need to get to their hotel, they didn't have a map problem. The Digirati had an Ajax map problem. There wasn't one. But I didn't have a directions map problem. And the amazing thing about Google Maps, when you first looked at it after you realized how cool it was, it was really hard to print and really hard to get the driving directions so I could take them with me when I went. So it was really cool and fun to do and to look at my backyard with the satellite. And so the Digirati, the boing boing people, we all went crazy. And it made it to the Times yesterday with the Sopranos. Really cool gimmick. And it's worth talking about, but not aggressively, because I'm not solving anyone's problem. It's an entertainment vehicle. And so the challenge there is if it's going to grow, it's going to grow because lots of people put in their SIG, here's how to get to my office. They put in their Squidoo lens, here's my Google map ready to go. They're, they put it on their company website, follow us by Google Maps. And that's blocking and tackling, because no. real radio doesn't feel broken. It, it is broken, but it doesn't feel broken. And if it doesn't feel broken, you're not going to dig deep. So what did they do that was brilliant? They broke radio by taking Howard off. And when you take Howard off radio to millions of people, radio is now broken. So they got to go figure out how to fix it. And the problem is maps weren't broken. You can't break them. And so it's really hard to figure out how you can monetize and grow that in the face of competition that can copy you. And sometimes you have to say, we can't win that one. It's going to be a tie. Well, also, Yahoo advertises. And there are TV ads for Yahoo. 
There are TV ads VR. They don't pay for themselves, but they exist. And so if you want to measure traffic, they're always going to win if they're willing to lose money on getting the traffic. You could also get more traffic if you use your home page and put a big Maps button there. But it would cost you a lot. It's not worth it. So again, back to my challenge. If I'm looking at Google 10 years from now, Google wins because 50 million or 500 million people all around the world have said, watch me search. Watch my life. Make it better. And if that was happening, then all of a sudden you know that I'm staying at the Artisan Hotel in Las Vegas. I don't have to go to Google Maps and type it in. It just shows up in my RSS feed, ready to go, directions from the airport to my hotel. That's what I want, not Ajax. Thank you. I got time for you, and I think I'll stop. Right. Thanks. A uh, related question is with these products that have network effects, uh, there's an advantage for the first mover. Uh, if we launch them early, we get a lot of users, right? Um, are we better off launching them early and then maybe adding the remarkable later so we, have, we get users and, you know, at some point we get the resources to put in the, the BAM? Uh, or do we wait to launch these products until we have something that's amazing at the risk of the competition launching something else before we do and being eBay? So here, here's, here's my answer. Uh, on the West Side Highway at 54th Street in New York, there's a really funny billboard. How many of you have seen it? Exactly. It's invisible to you. It doesn't exist. And the same thing is true for most people and delicious. The same thing true is for most people and lots of things. eBay wasn't the first auction site. eBay was the first auction site that figured out how to get its story straight and delivered on its promise in a way that was easy to scale. And so you don't have to invent the next thing that has network effects. What you have to do is tell the story to the right people on the right day in the right way so that they can quickly go and use it. And that's different. Does that make sense? So I think it's a mistake to launch something fast to be first if it's not good. I think it's got to be good. It's got to scale because your brand can't afford for you guys to launch stuff that's not good. But what you can do is take a look and say, wait a second. In just a few weeks, that thing is happening. How fast can we use that? and put it out better, good enough, worth our brand. And it's not a year. It's 8 to 12 weeks, because that's how long your competition is going to take to put something like that out. But if the mindset is, we're Google, it must be flawless, then you're never going to be able to have a purple cow, because we've all, all the Digerati have seen it before. And if we've seen it before, and you're the Me Too copycat company, then you become like a company up the coast a little bit. You don't want to be them. So I'll quit while I'm ahead. Thank you again for your attention. Keep up the great work. I'm a big fan.